everyone, and welcome to the Jeff Bullish Show. Today I have with me Ken Schmidt. Ken is one of the business world's most demanded executive advisors and speakers, driven by the acclaim he earned leading Harley Davidson Motor Company. And if you haven't heard of Harley Davidson, um, then you need to go back to school. He led them against all odds and turn around in the 1990s and the brink of financial ruin to global dominance. And we're going to learn a little bit into what was behind that. And here's some stories. He's the author of Make Some Noise, The Un Unconventional Road to Dominance, and the host of Tailgating with Geniuses podcast and co-founder of Talk Sessions Leadership Training. Ken's success, unconventional business approach and playful outspokenness had led him to consulting assignments with household brand names and transformed him into a highly requested speaker with more than 1,000 Turner keynotes presented globally to date. And just a little aside here, Ken owns a few Harley Davidson motorbikes that he still rides today. And uh, we're going to hear a bit more about those. Uh, I have a secret desire to get a V-Rod Harley Davidson, but uh, I'll, have, I'll have to ask Ken's advice about that. I just love the big fat tire in the back, really. So, Cat's out of the bag now, so it's not, it's not a secret desire anymore. <laughs> oh, damn, I forgot. Okay, this. All right, Ken, welcome to the show. It's an absolute pleasure and um, looking forward to hearing some more stories. So where, tell us how you got to actually be invited into the inner fold of Harley Davidson and to help them, you know, basically rebuild their brand and take over the world in their motorcycle niche. Tell us, how did that happen? Uh, it's oh. fantastic. Uh, thanks for asking. A, a, a fantastic alignment of the stars, I think, because uh, I was a guy who, who grew up with a tremendous passion and love for two-wheeled power two wheels and a motor on anything from right. the time i was a kid just appealed to me greatly i'd see an, an old motorized bicycle and think it was the coolest thing i ever saw i would see mini bikes and think that was the coolest thing i ever saw got into that and then uh, and this will sound crazy but if you remember uh evil knievel Oh, yes. He was, well, he was one of my heroes. Yeah. <laughs> for uh, Thanks for saying that, because for, for people like me, people of a certain age who, <laughs> who came of age in the, the 1960s and then into the 1970s uh, before, you know, as, before spectacles became as common as they are now. He, he, here was this daredevil guy doing these amazing stunts and flying through the air on a motorcycle while the entire world seemed to be watching and that was just so magical mm. to me and my friends and we imitated that and and i will will say and i have no data to back this up but certainly in the u.s anybody over oh geez uh anybody over the age of 60 that is into motorcycling mm -hmm. evil knievel was one of the big drivers of that made right. it look cool made it look exciting <laughs> uh, so I, would, I, I was drawn you know, moth to flame drawn to it and as I, I got older and, and more involved in motorcycling I never would have dreamt of getting involved professionally in the motorcycle industry uh, let alone that such an opportunity would even exist I was working in Chicago uh, in a PR marketing firm and a, at an event uh industry event one night over cocktails i was talking to a gal at a uh big ad agency up the street and in you know typical type conversation you know who do you work with and you know how's that and you know she's kind of rattling off the name of their clients and i'm rattling off the clients companies that i'm working with and then she just made this offhand comment she goes oh yeah and then we have this other account that nobody wants to work on uh harley davidson motorcycles and i, and I kind of spit and i said wait what <laughs> you have a Harley Davis business and, and nobody wants to work on it. And she goes, well, you know, none of our people ride motorcycles and Harley has this horrible reputation and they don't spend a lot of money. It's kind of going down the drain. And I said, oh my God, I would give my left leg <laughs> to work on that. And she said, come over tomorrow and let's talk. And I did. And by Friday I had moved over there, but this is the absolute best thing that could have ever happened. Uh, so I started going back and forth to Milwaukee up to, to uh, Harley's headquarters and getting involved in meeting all the players there. Uh, 
started doing some work and in, in, in some advisory stuff in the PR media positioning uh, and investor relations side of their business. Uh, and eventually I had the, you know, they said, well, geez, why don't you just jump across the desk and move up here to Milwaukee and just take this on full time? I was like, God bless you. There is a God. Uh, <laughs> there is a God because it, it, this is the way I looked at it. I said, and people say, why, you know, their business is going down the drain. Isn't that kind of a risky thing for you? And I said, well, no, I'm young enough that if it, you know, God forbid the worst thing does happen, you know, mm -hmm. it's not the, it's not the end of the line for me. But secondly, you know, uh, if this, if I do my job right and I get, you know, to, to plug into what other people there are, are doing, if we could do this and pull this off and turn this thing around, how cool to, to, to be part of that and to watch it. Yeah. And, and, and Jeff, e even on the worst day when you're, when it's snowing outside and it's cold and you're sitting through meetings or doing horrible things like spending a day with lawyers, uh, <laughs> you well, still, what? we just look around and we're, we're surrounded by motorcycles and motorcycle be, parts it, and all this. It'd be very careful that my partner's actually a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, we'll just say that I knew that uh, just, to, yeah, but she, she's just a, to keep it top of She's a court lawyer, so she's actually okay. It's all right. <laughs> well, then she, she knows what it's like to have those all those all day. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Meetings. So, uh, <laughs> Sorry, interrupted. Okay, go. but and that's okay. And, and what was interesting is it was a, uh, a very very dark time at at Harley. They'd already been in business, you know, since nineteen oh three. Right. Household name. People have been tattooing uh, Harley's logo on their body since World War One. I. I mean, just to, for you know for perspective for how old this thing is and how long it's been around. But by that point, uh, in the wake of lower priced, really well made, competitive stuff from yeah. Japan primarily, yeah. you know, all the names everybody knows: Honda, Yamaha, Kawasaki, Suzuki, and Germany. You know, BMW. A lot, lot of big names decided that they were going to get into big heavyweight bikes like Harley was building and basically make them faster, lighter, cheaper, uh, and arguably better. And basically uh, took all of Harley's market share away and the company was very quickly circling the drain. Yeah. Uh, very close to filing for bankruptcy. So it... it, it it, it was really bleak and really difficult, but I'll tell you that even though people are quick to blame, you know, all, all these big competitors came in and ate Harley's lunch, I always have to correct them and say, nope, they didn't. Uh, do, they came into the market and Harley fed them their lunch. Yep. It's made, made things too easy for them. Yep. Uh, didn't compete. J just, just tried to rest on the laurels of the business and promote and sell motorcycles. Uh, up against companies that had very, very deep pockets that had very, very good products. And the uh, Harley Davidson basically found itself non-competitive. And th that I see that happen to businesses every day all, all around the world. Is you've got people that are good at what they do, but not good at competing. Right. So what's the, so what was the secret source that, you were able to pull together with the the rest of the team at Harley to save Harley from extinction. You know, it was neat. Uh, it, it, it was a greatly reduced workforce because of, you know, layoffs and, and the, you know, the pending bankruptcy. Filing. Uh, the people that remained were very, very passionate motorcyclists. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I would never, uh, Never be able to talk about Harley, not not talk about talk about just how much the people that were there loved the business and wanted it to succeed. Mm -hmm. The unfortunate reality was was that virtually everyone that worked at the company believed that the reason for the business's existence was to build and sell products, motorcycles. We make something. We'll mm -hmm. make it, you know, we can make it better. Let's make it better, and that'll solve all of our problems. But see, that, that's kind of the fundamental problem I alluded to a minute ago, the, this belief that too many businesses have that, that we want to be known for what we do. 
and we want to do what we do really well. Mm -hmm. And see, the, the problem with that is, is that kind of just gets you into the game. You know, you have to be good at what you do. Mm -hmm. And you've got to do it well. And you've got to do it efficient, right? And, and you know, uh, you have to have an eye on doing things right. But it's extremely difficult to compete with that unless you're selling something that absolutely nobody else has. Unless you've got that cure for, you know, infectious diseases that nobody else has. No matter how good you are at what you do, somebody else is going to do it just as well. And then where are you? And then they're going to price their stuff lower than yours. Well, now you're in big trouble because now you're now you're forced to compete with product. Mm -hmm. And what Harley learned the hard way is that when you live by product, eventually you die by it because others figure out how to do it too. Mm -hmm. So what I think the biggest discovery accidental discovery that I had the biggest piece of learning was that what makes a business memorable to people isn't what the business does. It's who the business is. Think about it. Think about it this way, Jeff. If, you, if you're thinking about a business or talking about a business, no matter who it is, pick an airline. If you're talking about a business, you always humanize it and you use the pronoun they. I don't like them. They stink or they're awesome. They rock. I love this business. And what that means, we're not thinking in terms of what the business does because that that's understood. Mm -hmm. If we're thinking positive things about a business, we're thinking about the people behind the product, behind the service, the culture, the energy, the life force, you know, the, the, the passion, you know, or lack thereof that people remember and can identify with. So my, my take on that and what I, you know, teach and advise to, to the businesses is, is, is we have to be human first. Mm -hmm. We need to trip human levers, basic drivers of human behavior, basic human needs, and do it in a way that people see and appreciate and have gratitude for, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know, delighting people. Let's not build products and sell them to people and serve them. That's what everybody does, right? That's what we have to do. That's kind of the lowest level of expectation. What if we focus first on engaging people at a, at a human level? Mm -hmm. Let's be a source of delight for people, make people feel better about themselves, do things for people that they don't expect us to do. One, it puts a human face on the business, but something really magical happens, Jeff, because when you do something for another person that delights them, even the smallest measure of delight, it's basic human behavior. We're a joy-seeking species. We will seek out and return to any source of delight in our lives, no matter how small that delight is, until it fails to delight us. And that's what loyalty is. We're mm -hmm. not loyal to a motorcycle or a lawnmower or, you know, a piece of furniture. We're loyal to the, to the people behind it that made that happen. That made me feel this way about that. And that, that was absolutely huge for us because we said, look, instead of building our business around glorifying our product and glorifying what we do, let's instead glorify everyone associated with this business. Let's make the effort about making that customer, that potential customer, that dealer, that supplier, that kid who's out there looking at bikes. Let's, let's do something in front of them that delights them. Yep. All right. Let's let them see how much we love what we're doing here. You know, make our passion visible, make delighting them visible because they're going to see it, notice it, and react to it. Pow. And they absolutely did. And it created all kinds of points of preference for us. In a highly price-driven commoditized marketplace, people were willing to pay more, not not to buy the Harley. They were willing to pay more to do business with us, the human side of the equation. Right. So uh, I do remember that um, in some of the stories I've heard about Harley Davidson in that there was a tagline that was brought out, and maybe this was that tagline was about humanizing the experience that a Harley Davidson bike brought you as a human, the joy of the open road. Does, mm -hmm. 
can you so how did you get that message out there it's, it's um so I, I get that there's people remember joy and they'll go back to that well and feed there and drink from that well all the time mm -hmm. it's about choosing happiness and you find a place to sip at that table eat at that table you will go back and that could be a brand so how did you get this message out to the world a, a, a couple of ways that's a great question Jeff um what first of all what we sought to do uh, because we realized that when we are visibly present with the people that we serve we're able to you know talk with them about who we are and and gain tremendous insight into who they are how do you like to ride? What's a perfect weekend for you? Where would you go? If you could go anywhere in the world on two wheels, where would you go and who would you go with? And you just and get people talking about themselves and you're you know, kind of reacting to what they're telling you. And it, well, how would we have to change this bike to help you do that? And the guy would say, well, I wish I would need my handlebars to be higher, or handlebars to be lower. And, you know, we just furiously scribble all these comments down that they're making because they're basically telling us how they want us to change the product. Uh, to serve them better. Mm -hmm. So we determined, okay, we're going to be the most visible company in our industry where everybody else is waiting for customers to visit a dealership and come to them. We're going to be out. We're going to do tons of events at our dealerships, have our dealerships do you know, custom bike shows and ride shows, and fashion shows, just open house type party environments where people will come in, have a great time all under that Harley Davidson umbrella. Mm -hmm. have opportunities to create, you know, first name basis relationships with people at the dealership and other riders from their local community that, you know, they might just be meeting for the first time. And the feedback we started getting for people is that we, you're giving us excuses to get out and get together. Mm -hmm. And basically we didn't know that we were missing that in our lives this isn't a solitary pursuit this is something that it's more fun when we do it together with other people mm -hmm. god jeff the business benefit from that because now riders are coming in and they're bringing their friends you got to come you know meet at the dealership on sunday and we're going to have coffee and donuts and we're all going to go off and ride together you need to come and do this mm -hmm. it's so much fun and more larger and larger groups just kept being attracted you know like moths to this flame uh, there's a lot of fun stuff happening at the Harley shop or at this event that, you know, Harley's doing nationally or regionally or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Let's go spend time with the people from the Harley factory. Let's, let, let's talk to the people who design and engineer the bikes and who, who, who build them and paint them and customize them and all this wonderful stuff and get, get to know them as they get to know us and the dividends that that is paid. That that basically set the table for just the, the three plus decades run of complete market dominance that the company's been enjoying this social human side of, you know, what's essentially a commodity business. So are you so the tactics, if we can distill this. <clears throat> So what you're saying is that you said, okay, we're going to humanize the brand. We're going to bring bike passionate bike riders to meet other passionate bike riders who are the salespeople at the dealership. And then you're going to make it so much fun there that you are going to build a community that will then be word of mouth marketing that will actually then spread like a fire. Is that essentially what you do? Yeah. Let, let me distill it down a little bit further. So, because I, I don't want to give the impression that this was just some fingers snapped and magical things no, started happening. I, I'm, I'm sure it's it, not. It, so that's it. It, it, it involves uh, getting together with uh, Harley Davidson dealers and saying, essentially, look, what we've been doing collectively isn't working. What we want you to do is move, move away from this business that's here to sell products. I mean, obviously we have to do that, but we can't make the business around selling products. Instead, what we want to do is we want to humanize our business, trip some very, very basic drivers of human behavior, meet some basic human needs for people as they come in to see us, and instead focusing focus on delighting people, which means we can, we're not here to sell you a bike. 
Because if we lead with that, essentially what we're doing is encouraging you as a buyer to compare us to others. We don't want to be compared. To, we don't want you comparing the features and benefits of the products because a lot of that you're not going to understand anyway. You mm -hmm. know, and that's just going to force you to compare against somebody who's selling this, you know, stuff that looks the same for less money. So it works against us. So, yeah. so let, let's focus on making people really comfortable with us. Delight them. Uh, meet human needs for people that they're not used to having met, which means when somebody walks in instead of, you know, thanks for coming in today. Can I show you a bike? It's you, you're like, hey, great to see you. Come on in. You know, me casa is su casa. Grab a donut and a cup of coffee. Make yourself at home, man. So glad you're here. Ooh, people aren't used to that. Mm -hmm. Hey, this is kind of nice. It's a, it's not pressured. It's I have a chance to relax. I can get comfortable with the environment and the people that work here. Uh, and what's amazing is that we learned that there are these simple drivers of human behavior, these basic human needs that for most people are never met, right? We all have the, the needs to be fed every day and have shelter and, you know, water and, and, and love and connection. But what we also need at the same level as those uh, biological needs is, is we need to feel validation. Mm -hmm. We need to feel welcome and wanted and important and necessary and special and, you know, visible. Mm -hmm. Most pe human beings don't, in an average day, week, month, never experience that. Mm -hmm. Outside the house, people don't, you know, react or light up to you or greet you with a super friendly voice when you call on the on the phone when you're calling into someplace. We're you're, we're just all these invisible, you know, bodies, these invisible potential customers out there. Mm -hmm. What we found is that that when we intentionally tripped those drivers of, of human behavior met those needs light up and react in front of people reacting super positively to their arrival to their presence to whatever it is they're doing if people have a little dopamine released in their brains yeah someone's paying attention to me and i like that mm -hmm. and you know what do we do to any source of delight we keep coming back to it until it fails to delight us so as long as we as a as a business and people working in this business are focused on you know, delighting people and tripping these little human triggers, we're greatly increasing the odds that people are going to keep coming back for more of that. Yeah. And, you know, bring, bringing their friends with them. And and I get business people say, all the time, well, you know, we don't sell, you know, a cool thing like a motorcycle. You know, Elvis didn't get his picture taken, you know, with, and, uh, with our products like he did with yours. And, you know, uh, we're not famous. And I say, see, we're, that's not what we're talking about here. We're not talking about selling products or, or we're not talking about how, how well known you are for what you do. It's, we're basically just talking about who you are to the people that you serve and want to serve. Right. And the, and the human face that you put on, because if you don't change the behavior of the business, the business doesn't change. Right. <clears throat> you, I'm intrigued and curious about, so you create a one-off experience of joy, as in you bring them in, you run a week a weekend event. Mm. Um, so, but joy is not a destination; it's an ongoing journey. So, what was the so that was the start of the journey? What, what were the next steps in ter in terms of trying to continue to delight? I that was such such a perfect, perfectly timed question because as we began to to realize that look the, the the needle moves when we get together with people when a dealer does an event you know what at the end of the week they their cash register rang more than it did the week before okay let's connect some simple dots here get together with people they come in and they spend money that's good for our business good for their business we need to do more of this well how can we formalize this socialization of the of our sport this camaraderie thing yeah. that we're building uh so if you were to ever see somebody wearing a jacket that had a patch on the back that said harley owners group and there are millions of people around the world that wear those mm -hmm. uh, th that is all a reflection of 
the formalization of this process. Let's create through our dealerships, localized riding clubs called the Harley Owners Group. It's a social club that meets a minimum of, you know, once a month, in a lot of places as often as once a week on the grounds of the sponsoring dealership. A, a social club is, is happening. It's meeting, it's planning events, activities, maybe fundraisers for charities, dances, parties, and obviously a lot of riding together. Mm -hmm. uh, people pay to be part of this club. It's a dues paying club and you get to wear the patch on the back and it's got your name on the front and you, you belong to something that's really cool. So you're part of a and, tribe. And you are not only you're part of a tribe, but everybody that sees you knows that you're part of that yeah. tribe. And that feels good. To, you know, people look at me when I wear this jacket with all the patches on it. I like that. I'm going to keep wearing this jacket. I'm going to keep coming back for these events and these activities uh, and it was amazing and it's still amazing to see the the result of all of this because it gives people an outlet to be uh surrounded with like-minded individuals it gives people an, a, an opportunity to enjoy camaraderie while at the same time expressing their individuality mm -hmm. Look what I'm doing with my bike. Look what I'm doing with my clothes, the way I'm wearing the patches on the front and the things that I'm doing to stand out. And people always notice and react to that. Like, whoa, that's so cool what you did with your jacket. It's so cool how you customize your bike. And upon hearing that, you know, the guy's hearts, but I like this. Yeah, I'm, you know, I feel proud of myself. People are reacting to what I'm doing. I like that. Uh, and what I've always said, what I would get up in front of our investors and talk about, I say, you know where the money is in this business? It's the same place the money is in any business. It's, it's how we react to people. Mm -hmm. If you tell me something, you tell me something about your life, uh, about how you enjoy motorcycles, just tell me about your job. And I react like, like oh, well, that's so cool. Like, tell me more. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. If, if I'm genuinely interested in you you like that all human beings like that i mean that's where it drives social media that need that we have to have other people react to us yeah. you know and give us that thumb up when we're doing that for people first of all it it delights because folks we're just not used to it yep we're used to somebody actually acting like they care about us and are interested in us and are reacting positively to what we're saying is we can't help but notice that mm -hmm. i like that so on saturday morning if i'm going to run out and you know do some errands i'm probably going to include a, a little hop in and you know stop by the harley shop and run in just to get my that little dopamine release you know and, and, and a donut and just be surrounded by people that are being genuinely nice to me and acting like they're glad that i came in and wow that's that's a it's a potent elixir so the dealership became almost like a clubhouse. Is yeah, the, the the focal point of the lifestyle was yep. the way we were where it all happens. So was part of that um, rap well bringing people in for not only a donut and a coffee and a conversation mm -hmm. where you listen. And I'm a firm believer, in fact, passionate about being the best listener I possibly can be and asking the right questions. So I want to hear your story. That excites me when I'm mm -hmm. face to face. I'm essentially maybe an introvert, extrovert. I love, I would prefer a quality conversation rather than quantity conversation. So big conferences just horrify me in a sense, even though I've spoken at them. Then I go to a smaller conference and I have these, and I will choose to have quality conversations. So you're having quality conversations with the people that are going to buy your bike and are going to talk about your bike. Mm -hmm. And um, so one of the best books I've read recently is, um, I'm trying to remember his name, but it's How to Know a Person. And I've experimented with some of the things he revealed in there on top of the other things about how to listen. And it's uh, when you can get someone to reveal their life story to you and they're a stranger. I've found that both liberating for me and you can see them light up. Um, and you sound like you were doing that for your customers. What's interesting about that is I was 
of all places in Lithuania. And I'm talking to a professor from Oxford in the, the UK. And we're talking about this, about kind of the behavioral, sociological stuff that uh, the businesses can intentionally plug into and do. And I was talking so much about, you know, when we listen to people and react to people, you can, their face always changes. It, it, they could have a serious question, have a problem, but the, people just kind of light up when they have an opportunity to talk about themselves exactly. and what's important to them. And the guy summed it up so perfectly. It should be a bumper sticker. It says that the, the whole world would improve if we all stopped being interesting and instead we're interested. Yeah. If we tell me about yourself. Yeah. That every human being has that has the same favorite topic of discussion. Me, yeah. let me talk about me for a while. And, yeah. uh, and it applies to even the simple, very, very uh, core thing about humanity is, you know, dating, getting married, is that on the dating scene, if you are interested, mm -hmm. then you are much more interesting. And because everyone loves to talk about themselves, just like you mentioned. And uh, I had the best comment given to me by a friend of my partner. She said about me to my partner, she said, Jeff was both interested and interesting. And you put those two together and I feel, I wow, said, wow, that's exactly what I want to be. But, but it isn't it amazing though, if you look at the businesses that you work with, the places that you buy, the, the places where you shop, the things that you buy online, Think about what you were taught in school. Nobody ever talked about this. Nobody ever said, hey, you know, how about instead of when somebody, you know, walks into the business or greets us at the trade show, how about a, instead of us not immediately going into trying to sell our stuff? Selling. Yep. Here's why. Oh, thanks for coming in today. Have you seen, you know, the new product line here? How about if we just stop and take a step back for a second? Let, let's just see ourselves the way others see us and say, well, what would we want? Mm. Said, I just, you know, I just entered your, your trade show booth. I entered your space. I, I met you at a cocktail party. How about just make it about me mm -hmm. just for a few seconds or just like lead with that. It diffuses everything, makes people instantly comfortable. And the fact that someone is paying attention to me is instantly noticed by a hundred percent of the human race, mm -hmm. but we don't, God, we don't do that. How many times you, you call a business and the first thing you hear is a, first of all, computer generated prompts. Mm, that's always a downer. Uh, you know, press two for sales, press three for service, and then you get music for a half an hour. And in those painful moments, and your mind has already painted a picture of what that business is mm -hmm. and what it's about. And you don't like it. Yeah. I don't like them. I don't like their approach or, you know, please hold. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I, I'm in a hurry. I don't want to please hold. Or, or you enter the doctor's office and, and all you see is, you know, the, the top of someone's head that's sitting behind a desk that gives you forms to fill out. Mm. Well, we're, we're so used to it. We don't even notice it anymore. But when that doesn't happen, when you sit walking, hey, and somebody lights up or when they're talking to you on the phone and you just hear this enthusiasm just kind of dripping out of them. Yep. Like when he called, when he called Disney, he said, God, how are these people so pleasant? Because they have to be, they're doing this on purpose. Mm -hmm. And you hear this, it just sounds right. Feels right. Makes you feel, you notice immediately. And then, then you just ask the obvious question. Why doesn't everybody do this? Mm -hmm. Why is that so hard to be passionate, enthusiastic about people instead of, you know, just treating them like an invisible entity that we hope will buy our product. Yeah. So let's continue further. So you, mm -hmm. you've got them in for donuts and coffee. You've got them mm -hmm. coming in and you've created a club and a tribe. And I suppose to add to the joy, you're giving them, you start to give them merchandise. What, I'm just trying to get a feel for when, when did you, Harley Davidson yourself, the aha moment going, okay, this is really working. This being just wanting to hear the story and experiences and the humanization of, about the customer and their passion for bikes, you know, biking. What were the next, from the aha moment, 
and can you remember when you sort of start to say something's going on here? Because as humans, we, go, we have a sense of there's something going on here and it's maybe a little bit magical. But can you remember that or did you? I, I, I absolutely can't remember it because what there's a lot of things, you know, in business that are hard to quantify. Mm. How do we know specifically what the return is on our, our, our bringing our trucks and doing bike demonstrations at event? How, the, how return on, the return on listening. How yeah, it, it, that? exactly. It, it, it's hard to do, but what started yeah. happening in, in relatively uh, short order is that the the principal critics in the bike industry, the, the the main bike magazines of the world, and picture the, the European and Australia ones that are very intensely uh, written, very intensely critical of things they don't like, uh, and not the most laudatory. You know, they're, they're publications written by critics. Critics who for decades were never saying anything positive about, or at least they're company's too old the products are outdated they're too expensive suddenly we're, we're we're seeing tremendous ink about the effort that the people that the business are making to spread the passion the joy the love of motorcycling and and, and the love of harley davidson the, the, this company is obviously like kind of changing right in front of us it's kind of cool geez you know bike industry follow do what they're doing and we're like, okay, this is, people are noticing it's working. And, you know, our sales are going up. And was the that the aha moment? The, the, that was the big oh. aha moment. Like, okay, people are, people but, other than just the people working here are, are seeing this, reacting to it positively. We need to do more of this. It's proving to us that doing things like uh, budgeting for advertising, kind of traditional go-to-market tactics, is not working because it, it that that was an easy ROI back when we were essentially bankrupt or advertising, uh, but not selling anything. So what's the ROI on that? Well, how about zero? Uh, was wasted money because we were just on there on the page right next to your competitor. So basically, it's here's product, here's product, here's product, and people say, well, we're awash in this. There's tons of product, and it all gets kind of confusing and looks alike and. Uh, theirs is cheaper and does the same thing. Well, right, duh. Anybody that's shopping with their brain instead of their heart would be buying the cheaper stuff. And, you know, that was our fault. You know, we we're just doing what everybody else did because that's Price what we thought we were supposed to do. Yeah. Yeah. So as, he, as, he, as this, as the business was becoming more, more humanized and more social, we said, look, we have to do more of this. This needs to be the emphasis of the business. We need to build the entire business process around being visible, plugged into and listening to the people that we serve and, and hope to serve. And we looked at, and this is something every business on the planet, Jeff should do if you're a, a one person business or a hundred thousand person conglomerate. I say, we need to answer three questions. Uh, what do people say about us? What do we want them to say about us? Mm -hmm. And th what are we doing to get them to say this about us? Mm -hmm. And what we found and what most people find is that uh, what people say about us is this e either negative. In our case, it was negative. They, they are saying a lot of negative stuff. Companies antiquated, old, uh, you know, associated with criminal gangs, uh, you know, just preposterous, grossly exaggerated stuff. Uh and what are we saying about ourselves? Oh, you know, it's it's quality, it's well made, and it's craftsmanship. And uh, look at the engineering, and look at the rideability and the reliability, and the miles per gallon and the miles per hour and the horsepower, uh, all of which is really great data, but virtually non distinguishable from what competitor stuff was, right? Because it's two wheels and a motor and a seat and a set of handlebars. You can't get much more scientific. Than that, unless you have a PhD in engineering, uh, what we needed to do is say we need to change our vocabulary because if we know that someone is talking about us, we want people using the same differentiating language for us. 
So yeah, they know we make motorcycles that couldn't be more obvious. And yeah, they're really good. And yeah, they're historic. Very true. But BMW can say the exact same thing. Honda can say the exact same thing. The guy's been around forever too. So if we're saying what our competitors say, we're essentially commoditizing ourselves and endorsing them. Right. There's nothing memorable in talking about, you know, we have such good quality here and we're so committed to our customers here because that's what everybody says. Yep. So, so should, let's craft a different vernacular. Let's, let's pick three to five words that we can weave into all of our go-to-market stuff, weave into our conversations that we have with customers, potential customers, so that when other people talk about us, these are the words that pop into their minds. Mm -hmm. uh, so in literally in, in one day, we came up with a f essentially a five pillar vocabulary of, of the words, lifestyle, freedom, camaraderie, individuality, and rebellion. Let's position our business around this lifestyle being the driving word. We don't sell motorcycles. We sell a lifestyle. Everybody else in the industry sells stuff. We yep. sell a lifestyle. That's the getting together. That's the socializing. It's whatever picture forms in your brain when you hear a word like lifestyle. And uh, people, the, the, I remember like the, like the Wall Street crowd, the investment crowd, say, well, why are you saying that? And I said, All right, do you think you're going to forget it? No, we're a lifestyle company. And they did remember it. The freedom, we sell freedom. Well, what does that mean? Whatever you want it to mean. All right, camaraderie, getting together with your friends. What's the opposite end of camaraderie? Individuality, being able to express yourself in front of your friends and stand out and be different. And rebellion against what everybody else in the industry is doing. And when we weave those words, I defy any human being to enter a Harley dealership and not hear and see the word freedom mentioned almost immediately or lifestyle. Uh, yeah. It, well, that's any business. Do this. Yeah. So that obviously turned up in taglines. So there was a famous tagline I think that Harley did come up with. Um, it's come up with maybe several, quite a few over the years. What was the tagline you used back then to kick this off? Can you remember? Uh, well, first the, there was, uh, well, to put it this way, when the company was in trouble, the tagline was motorcycles by the people for the people. Uh, which sounded cool and it was kind of cool, but it was very product centric. Yep. Uh, then uh, more than a machine, which started playing to the, hey, we we want to not just be known for the motorcycle itself. It's it's more than that. It's everything that we do to support the motorcycle community. Uh, but then most of the taglines actually disappeared where we would just put a Harley logo on something and maybe like one word next to it, like or like freedom or let freedom ring that type of, mm -hmm. uh, to, first of all, to play to that language, that, that differentiating language, but also to do something in a way that people see it and would immediately identify it with, with us. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's, there's never been a lot of big taglines in the last, 30 year positioning lines. Yeah. Or maybe, a, you know, something cute, uh, on an ad somewhere, but that's, that that's never been, or at least hasn't been for, for years. One of the driving points of the, of the uh, business that's come up with these taglines. It's yeah. Let's just keep focusing on what we do well. So you've, so at the dealership, you built, you come up with these five key words, which have become the five pillars of the soul of Harley Davidson. Because mm -hmm. you're no longer selling a product. You are now touching people's souls for wanting to have these things that bring them joy. Because camaraderie brings joy. Lifestyle brings joy. Rebellion can be a place of joy. Um, Absolutely. Freedom. Individuality is a huge one. For all, yeah. All, all, yeah. all of the above. Yeah. So in other words, you've almost touched everything that makes us human, which is a, especially in a world of technology, man versus machine, AI and machine and man now. Um, so 
I think we're at a very, very interesting pivotal point in human evolution where how do we maintain our human soul while the machine seems to be doing almost everything for us? And what, what, what's nice about that, though, is that because we're, we, we've all been lulled into this sense of, uh, I don't want to say complacency, but it's almost like normalcy, that, that all of the technology is so woven into everything that we do that we sort of lose sight of the fact that we're, we rapidly lost our humanity for, you know, mo most people, the only way that they get validation is on their phone because somebody gave a thumb up or a like on one of their social media. Oh, so humans are starved for validation. They're, they're starved for, you know, human touch for a human relationship to, to be able to talk live to other people, to be reacted to. Yeah. We seek it out. We notice immediately when it happens. And, and, and that's, you know, one of the things I talked to, business leaders about is look if we know people are hungry for this yep. and they know they're not used to getting it why shouldn't we be the ones that 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 give it to them? why shouldn't we be doing that for our employees and not treat them like hired hands that are hard to keep as you know, be a source of delight for them so that they come back and and tell their friends and feel like they're part of something big and that they're appreciated for who they are and what they do and what they bring to the table uh, all of those things are, are little human behavioral triggers that we can, if we decide that we want to do that, we, we can put an emphasis on doing that for people. So in other words, what we're trying to do, and highly trying to do, is trying to use technology to make us more human. Well, what the, what the, 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 the technology is always going to be there. And what, what technology can do is it can teach you know, it can inf inform us of something. It can show us something new, uh, you know, let us know something is happening. Uh, and that's what, maybe 20, 25% of the equation. Okay, somebody's now aware of us or what we're doing. But anything beyond that, uh, if it, I mean, look at company websites. Every, the, the faster I can get you to hit that buy button, the better. Yep. That's all we've been conditioned to do. Uh, there's, there's no wit, there's no warmth, there's no humanity, there's no sense, hey, you belong here, we're, we're glad you're here, and you hit a buy button, uh, and you buy that product, and it shows up at your door two days later, but you don't, you can't even remember who you got it from. You got what you paid for. Uh, and that and somewhere in that business, you know, they got a little check mark because they made us, you know, they made another sale. Well, yeah, but the person doesn't remember it because nothing happened. Uh, yeah. So did did we really win here? No, because our next purchase to that person is going to cost as much as this one did because we have to go out and find them again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, interesting in terms of how do we weave more humanity into everything we do? And I think, um, you know, and it's something I think about a lot, especially because I work in technology um, and I'm intrigued by the intersection of, the machine and man, AI and man, mm -hmm. and I'm using man, you know, in politically incorrect way. <laughs> but, but I know what you mean, all of us. <laughs> and uh, human, maybe you could use, but I digress. The, the reality for me is how do we, how do we make technology work for us and make us more human? And I, I watch younger people and everyone actually walking down the street and they're not saying hi anymore. They've just got their head on the phone. They've got mm -hmm. their earpods in. So you actually can't say anything to anyone as they walk down the street like hi, because they're not going to hear you. Um, they gather around a dinner table and you watch them. And it'll be five people looking at that phone. There is no conversation. We're intermittent. And they are looking for validation. I think that's a very interesting word you brought up with is actually look at me, I'm important. And by you inviting people into the shed of Harley Davidson, the tent of Harley Davidson, mm -hmm. is that you are validating the humanity. You belong, you are important. Um, and we're hearing you. Let me share something because when when I talk uh it could be at a college, university, an investment group somewhere, and they'll People will always say, oh, you know, we, I, I've read case studies about Harley, so I know it's a, it's a great manufacturing story. Or I've read a case study, it's a great marketing story. And I said, 
but you're forgetting the umbrella above all of that. Uh, yeah, it's a great marketing story. Yeah, it's a great product story, but it's a, it's a great human behavior story first. We learned how to plug into what attracts people. And, and I was a perfect example. And I say, well, what, what do all Harley owners do? If you see a guy on a bike or a gal on a bike sitting at a red light or at a stop sign, if they're on a Harley, what are they doing? They rev their, rev their engine. I do. We all do it. I'm not moving, but I'm revving my engine anyway. It serves absolutely no practical purpose. We say, well, why are we doing this? And, and the answer is really simple. This is, is we're talking to you. The engine is loud. We're saying three simple words. Look at me. Look at me. And when you do look, you know, even if it's just for a second, sooner or later, you're going to look like, my God, what's that noise over there? You look, when we see you see us, our eyes meet for a millisecond. Dopamine's released in our brain. Somebody just noticed me. me. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, when I'm in my car, people don't look at me. When I'm walking down the street, they, they don't. But when I'm around here and I do this, they look. I like the way that feels. Roll up to the next light and do it again, you know, proving that we always, you know, anything that delights us, we return to until it fails to delight us. Mm. That's why we, as a business, what are we here to do? Are we here to serve? No, we're here to be a source of delight for people because if we do that, they'll come back for more. And if I'm the leader of a business, what's my job? My job isn't to get people to follow me and do what I tell them to do. Mm -hmm. uh, my job is to to delight them so they see in me mm -hmm. uh, something rich, something human, something rewarding that this person understands me. This person, this, you know, I'm way more likely to follow and return to this person because he or she is making that effort, that human effort to be a source of delight for me. And I delight people by validating, making them feel welcome and special and amazing. I'll be at a tech company in mm -hmm. California and I'll be walking down the hall with the People running the business while other employees walk and they just walk right past them and don't say anything. I said, you have to acknowledge everybody. You just walk by 10 people that are going to go home tonight and say they saw the CEO or they saw the boss. Well, what do they say? Nothing. I mean, you, you've got all of these chances to, to do that for people. Just, hey, good to see you. Well, whatever that is, people notice that the boss looked at me. The boss spoke to me. The boss talked to me on the elevator. You know, ask me about me and what I did this weekend. She's so nice here. What a great guy he is. Oh, that's what moves the needle for it. And people come back. It takes fences down. It removes barriers. It removes fear. You know, it makes us approachable. Mm. But does it happen? Mm. Not enough. No, it doesn't happen enough. And, um, you have to go from a small town to a large town to realize that not enough people are saying hi as they walk past on the way to the beach or the way to the mm -hmm. coffee shop. Eyes are averted. Um, and it's a, very obvious if you go from small town to big town. And it's that that's the most simple form of validation. I see you. So from this, Obviously, I'm not I, invisible anymore. Somebody I'm, sees I'm, me. Yep. I'm not invisible because we get lost if we we feel lost if we are invisible. It's the worst thing you can do to a person is make them invisible. Mm -hmm. That you make them an outcast. So let's quickly. Um, I'm conscious of your time, but the, the drought of this, how did you then layer what you did at Harley? And then the other question I'm curious about yeah. is how did you apply, how do you apply this to other, is there a process you take companies through? Yeah. Uh, it might be loose, it might be strict um, to actually make them visible and do the things you've done at Harley. So number one, what? how did you take it to, you know, X, you know, 10X Harley? How did you do that? the last few steps and then how do you hack and other people take what you learned at Harley and apply it to their own business? Two questions. The, 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 let me ask, answer the second one first, because it, 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 it's always top of mind with people. And, you know, when I go in to work with them at a, at a business, you know, you know, say, what do you want to be known for? You know, what do you want people to say about this business? 
And what, you know, one of two things will happen. First, if I'm asking the CEO or the person running the business, I'll say, well, if someone's talking, you know, customers talking about you right now, what would you want them to be saying? And the CEO said, well, you know, he'll put his hands behind his head and stare at the ceiling. Well, I guess I want, and I said, you guess? You mean, you haven't thought about this? You don't know what you want the reputation of this business to be because the reputation of the business is a reflection of you. Uh, so we, as the people that are leading this business, we need consistency on this. What do we want to be known for when people talk about this business? Because if we don't have that, our employees certainly don't have it, which means our salespeople don't have it, which means the, the market is never going to know who we are because guess what? We don't. And more often than not, Jeff, that, that is one of those head thumpers for people. Uh, my God, we never thought of that. I said, it's because you're too focused on doing what you do and being more efficient about what you do and not looking at your business the way an outsider does. You think you're great. You think you're so good at what you do, and you should. But somebody who doesn't know you that's looking in from the outside is immediately going to compare you to other people that do other businesses that do the same thing. So now what have you got, right? That That's when the head scratching starts and that's when they start saying, well, geez, yeah, may, maybe we're not doing this right. Yes, yeah, so what you're not doing is you're not competing. You're, you're, you're going to market and doing what you do. Let's look at what would happen in this business, in this company, if people knew you for who you were. So you were con consistent in, First of all, in your messaging of what the business is and, and and why you're here doing what it is that you do for people. Let's get really consistent on that first. But then let's also look at what, what kind of behavior do we need to exhibit in front of people to bring our positioning to life to make us more human. And I say, well, you know, we don't often, you know, speak with or get in front of customers. I say, well, well who's answering the phones? Who's, who's the customer service rep? Who's the receptionist? Who, who's talking to people? Okay, well, what, what kind of training are they getting? Right? And a lot of times it's, you know, hello, thank you for calling. You know, please hold us in. Bang, said, in that second, the entire humanity of this business has been exposed. Uh, one person becomes the they that, you know, they stink or they're awesome. They're amazing based on that one, yeah. that one human being. And, and I say, you know, this is, I know that the, it's kind of a foreign concept to people, but I said, I know this is what you don't think about, but this is what you, you need to think about if you're going to put humanity first, lead with a more human face, to put a human face behind the business. And as a leader of the business, <clears throat> every employee that works here, if there's 10 or if there's 10,000, everything they do is a mere reflection of the attitudes and behavior of the leaders, the people running the business, they model you, they do what you do. They say what you, they, they say what you say. They say how you say it. Mm -hmm. We all do. Uh, so think of the impact it has on the organization here. If you are very visibly, very, very passionately being uh, leading with humanity, being human first, being a source of delight instead of simply being, you know, a boss or a leader or telling people what to do. Mm -hmm. And watch how people react. And then when you see how they react and it's positive, you'll say, geez, we, we need to align our whole culture around this. How so do we that, do that? Yep. So it comes back to the three questions that you mentioned a while yeah. ago. In other words, what are customers saying about you? What do you want them to say about you? And how do we get them to say that about us? Yeah, because this is, and when people are talking about you, first of all, again, they always use the pronoun they. Mm -hmm. which means they're, they're, uh, you know, what does that company do? You know, make cars. Now they say they are great at something. They're horrible at something. So they're talking about your people. That's a reflection of your culture. And that's the job of the leader to determine well, you know, what do we want this culture to be? Mm -hmm. Let's make it that. Mm -hmm. And we can do that. We, we can ingrain that into the DNA of the business. It just, it, it needs to become part of our business process here. That's the, the, the job of leaders is to create that environment, not to delegate responsibility of that to somebody else, you know, the HR department or the sales department, because we all know that doesn't work. So, yeah. So do you take people through 
like what you did at Harley was in one day came up with five keyword pillars. Yeah. Yeah. You take us through that process as well. So that sounds to me like one of your major, but could be quite quick, but distilling what you stand for and put that into just a few words. What, what, what's amazing is, is what I what I will do is I will say, okay, give, give me, you know, who are your top five or six competitors, whatever. And you just put all of their, just punch up their website and put their home screen up on the page. Let's look at how they describe themselves and let's find the common words on every page. And you'll, you'll see, you know, quality, uh, uh, commitment to customer satisfaction or, or, or your know, rates or data, if it's a bank or something in financial services, I'm like, are you starting to see a pattern here? Yep. I see. And what's the pattern that everybody's saying the same thing. You go, that's right. Now let's put yours up there. Wow. You're doing it too. Mm -hmm. Th this is your, this is the face of your business to the public. Is that what people, you want people to think they're the same as everybody else? No. I said, then this is everything they're saying is what you're going to stop saying that mm -hmm. they've defined their pillars of quality and customer satisfaction and our people make the difference and we're customer centric and all this. And when that's what they're saying, that's their cue. They're telling you what not to stand for, what yeah. not to say. And then they say, well, let's, let's come up with, and, and that's ideation. It's creativity. Let's just come up with some different language to describe who we are. So then you to describe what we do, and then you'll be memorable. Mm -hmm. First of all, then, people aren't used to hearing that, but uh, it if they like the freedom word with Harley or lifestyle, as people hear it enough, it just becomes automatic, mm -hmm. uh, and and that's what you want because when the the customer is repeating, they're describing you the way you would, mm -hmm. and using one you know or two or that more if you're really lucky that that language that you use. That's what you know what's working. That's what you know you're you're wholly differentiated in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. In the marketplace, so, people know you for who you are. Yeah, let's be human, and let's show that visibly. Please be human, God. If you have to see one more <laughs> really bad, really bland, really predictable website, I mean, look at packages that show up at your house, Jeff. Mm. Like, what would it have? taken because I, I, I say this all the time is we all do it we all buy things from businesses we've never heard of right we go online and because we want to buy something a, a belt then you'll hit your google or your search thing and you'll find whoever's willing to sell you that one that you're looking for you know with the lowest price mm. whether you've ever heard of them or not boop you hit the buy button and the next day the brown box is right there by the front door where you expected it to be mm. and you open it up and what's inside the box the thing that you bought mm. and you don't remember where it came from. You don't care, right? It's, you got what you paid for. And I always tell us, what would it have hurt for you to insert something into that package, that box on the outside, anything that would have made this a more memorable and surprising thing for the person that opened it. Yeah. I mean, a little, a little wit, a little warmth, a little humanity, a little sign thank you note from the person who stuck it in the, you know hey jeff hope you love this let us know how we're doing you know click well, somebody took two seconds to do that it's hard to not notice it mm. but does anybody do it oh boy got and got for somebody does something that's a little bit witty or makes you hey that's kind of funny or that's kind of cool or a little a little pack of cookies in the but whatever that is it's mm. somebody made a little extra effort beyond what was expected mm -hmm. uh, you remembered but you don't remember the other you know 99 things you bought that month but for whatever yeah. reason that stood out like because somebody made an effort yeah so harley davidson been a big success for you and the team you worked with what are maybe another couple of successes that uh maybe surprised you but maybe not surprised you that um following this approach that we've talked about um, have succeeded and uh, 10x their business, whatever it was. Can I, you I am more examples. I am absolutely enthralled. Uh, well, I, I love to fish. I'm a fisherman. That's one of my favorite hobbies. Right. And that is a 
sadly, it's a declining industry. People aren't getting involved in the sport. There's a million manufacturers making everything from fishing rods to reels to lines to lures, you name it. And there's a company in Wisconsin called St. Croix Rod. Family-owned business, kind of a smaller niche player for decades that is now known in an industry of tremendous commoditization. You know, every fishing rod looks like a fishing rod looks like a, a fishing rod. And, you know, a lot of stuff is coming from overseas. In fact, most of it is very, very competitively priced stuff. They built their entire, uh, the soul of the business now mm -hmm. is that you can, you can talk to anybody there. If you call with a question, you want to ask about a good, uh, good place to go fishing. You've got a question of how to do something, where to go. You've got a problem with your equipment, with your rod. You're going to hear the friendliest human beings you've ever talked to. If something broke, they're going to have another one shipped and on its way to you almost immediately. Their largest go to market expense is their, is customer service. It's, it's giving people new stuff for anything that, that fails to perform. Mm -hmm. And doing it in a way that is so overtly friendly and unexpectedly gracious mm -hmm. that their market has just shot straight up. And I go to industry events and you wear, you know, one of their shirts or hat that says, say, Corey, everybody, oh yeah, those, they're doing a phenomenal job. And I say, well, what's, how do you know that? What's how the name of that? that? What's the name of that brand? St. Croix. St. Croix. Okay. Yep. St. Croix rod. And they're doing just cool. gangbusters business. Uh, you can use that, that that's a consumer business and you can use things like in the, in the business to business sphere, uh, 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 an enormous metal forgery mm -hmm. forge, excuse me, <laughs> metal forge in Illinois. Yep. Uh, absolutely phenomenal business and what what they are able to they they've taken something where they produce enormous pieces of metal uh you know things that are going to go on to naval ship you know the, the a, a giant gear for a piece of mining equipment and the gear is is bigger than your house stuff yeah. that you would never think about mm -hmm. the company's called scott forge s-c-o-t forge again they they realize look this is a commoditized business space they do a tremendous amount of you know government contracting where everything is you know traditionally thrown up to bid where the the buyers don't care about where it's coming from have yeah. now tremendously visible tremendously passionate uh, leaders of that business the every meeting that they show up at uh, if they're doing lobbying in Washington, D.C., if they're at a trade show event, they wear a tartan sport coat, a plaid coat. And you think, well, that's kind of corny. Yeah, it is kind of corny, except 100% of people in the metal forging business know when the Scott Forge people mm -hmm. roll in. Everybody in Washington knows when the Scott Forge people are in town. They're the world's nicest people because that's what the leaders leader of the business, a great guy named John Case says, this is what we're going to do. We're going to be the most visible people. And we are, God knows we're visible because we've got the jackets on when people approach us. So they ask about the jackets. That's an opportunity for us to not talk about what we do, but talk about who we are mm -hmm. and people and watch people react. And it's the, the, the same thing. They are easily the most recognized firm now in a ridiculously commoditized old school market space. Mm, wow. So this is, this is fascinating. I just love it because of we're humanizing business, which, um, and, and for me, a tagline we use how to win at business and life. In other words, business is not something separate to life. And for me, life is not separate to business. Thank you for saying that. Cause I, and I wish everybody looked at it that way. Yeah. So, um, but how do you weave that? And you've actually challenged me to think about that more. Um, and because we're a digital business, so podcasting, newsletters, and, you know, content. 
and we're leaning more into the intersection of AI and humanity, which I'm intensely curious about. Um, and it's actually becoming compelling because I believe that it can make AI, can make us more human if we use it in the right way. I hope so, yeah. I, that's, my, that's my aim, is to, not for AI to replace us, but to enhance us. So, right, right, right to God's ear. I hope I, I hope he's listening to that because too many other people, everyone's so afraid of it now, which yeah. is understandable. We, we we fear what we don't understand. Oh. But if you ask, if you say AI to most people, they mean it's, well, it's going to that's going to take all our jobs. Mm -hmm. It's going to destroy jobs. And you know they said that when cars and motorcycles replaced horses, and when tractors replaced horses, and and when computers appeared, everything's going to replace. Um, the internet up here oh that's going to take take jobs away because now people can buy directly instead of going to you know physical brick and mortar every threat has turned out to be a, a benefit instead of mm. a threat and i think the same thing will happen with with yeah. ai assuming that people yeah treat it properly yeah well that's sort of becoming a bit of a mission for me so um um just two questions to finish off yeah it's been an absolute pleasure having this fireside chat and hearing the stories behind the story of Harley Davidson. Fun for me. Yeah. And I've got two questions. Number one is what are the two or three biggest takeaways you've learned over the decades um, advising Harley Davidson and others that you think all business owners should lean into? Uh First of all, and, and I don't know, you can probably see this on, on the back of my phone, you see the letters R and R. And that's on my phone for a reason. It's on my laptop for a reason. It's on a little placard uh, in my office. And that is to remind me that anytime I'm talking to someone, I'm about to speak with someone, I shouldn't be thinking about how do I get this person the information that they want? Or how do I answer this person's question in the most efficient way possible? It's, it's, or what do I want this person to remember and repeat? What do I want them to remember about this conversation about me and repeat as in tell somebody else about, or come back for more of, yep. so you're a leader and it's like, it's the guy, it's the, the, the C-suite people walking down the hallway at work or coming up in the elevator and you're surrounded by People that work with you and for you that important your business. Well, what do you want them to remember about you and tell other people? Mm -hmm. It's going to be a hundred percent based on what you say to them and how you make them feel when they're in your presence, the effort that you've made to do that mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. and most of us choose not to. Let's just answer the question and move on. And not think, geez, these people have uh these people can and will build my reputation and the reputation of this business if I choose to mm. do that. Yeah. Uh, most choose not to. And then most also uh, th this notion of Mr. or Mrs. Business person, please don't focus on making your business known for what you do. Make it known for who you are, because that's the only competitive advantage that anybody has anymore. Uh, uh, the world's commoditized. You want to be known for the human qualities that your business has and the best way to bring that out is by being more human focus on delighting being interested instead of interesting validating people being that source of validation for people it's modelable behavior when leaders do it their employers do it when you're doing it in your cubicle the person next to you hears you you doing that and here's how people are reacting they start to model that too it softens us makes us look more, you know, warm and approachable and it makes ultimately our business more competitive. It's kind of stop doing things the way you've always done them uh, because anybody can do that now. Yeah. So there's that uh, sentence which I call back occasionally, remember occasionally is people forget what you said, but they will not forget how you made them feel. Uh, it's so true. It's, it's almost bumper sticker corny, but it's absolutely true. But what I also say to that is that Customers don't forgive mistakes, but friends do. Right. But when people, can, when they can put that human side on your business and you've done something and they feel like they know you, they might not know anybody personally, but they feel like they know you, you know, that these people try hard, uh, you know, they made a mistake, 
forgive him. You know, we'll, we'll move on. But if I don't know you and you made a mistake, well, now you let me down and I'm going to tell everybody that, you know, you're terrible. Yeah, I love that. That's great. So the last question is, um, yeah. this comes to, back to what brings you joy. Mm -hmm. We've talked about producing joy for customers and making them memorable. So if you didn't have to work, you do this for free, what brings Ken Schmidt joy? Oh, uh, take out the obvious, you know, family and, and home and things like that. I, I, I love adventure. I love being outside. I love riding my motorcycle. I love fishing. I like standing in a river and fly fishing. I love standing in a boat and fishing. I love to hike. I love to hunt. I love to you know, view nature. Anything that's outside and involves movement, I like a lot. Mountain biking. I know you're a bicyclist. Uh, it, mm. There's just something about being outside between a bunch of trees on a path, previously yeah. pedaling a, a, a bicycle that just does something for me. Yeah, I get that. I've just bought myself an e-mountain bike. So Good I, man. So I can explore fire trails and mountain trails uh, with my brother is part of it. Also, one of the joys I have is I don't understand why people cycle inside. I, I just can't. I need to be outside, even if it's a slightly dangerous. And I have been hit by a car. Uh, broken shoulder. Oh, you're not supposed <laughs> to do that. You know what? It probably said on the first page of the owner's manual for your bicycle, there's probably a warning about that. And you <laughs> could... <laughs> Exactly. So Don't that's crash. great. Yeah. So, but as part of that, do you like combining a bit of solitude along with camaraderie? Uh, when you oh, at... Absolutely. And, and it's being with like-minded people, I mean, Your tribe. You know, I was just I was just out in Montana fishing last week. Oh, lovely! Bunch of great friends, uh, s s some of whom I've met through motorcycling, some of whom became motorcyclists as a result of meeting me. The way that I became a fly fisherman is a result of being mm -hmm. with them. And well, there's there's nothing better than doing something together that you enjoy a physical activity, fishing, biking, whatever that might be, and then you know having a bourbon next to the fireplace at night uh, when the stories get told and the uh, the laughter gets louder. That's that to me is as good as it gets. That's great. Thank you, Ken, for sharing your stories and also revealing you know, corners of your soul and what brings you joy. And uh, it's been an absolute joy for me to actually have this conversation. And um, I'm grateful. Thank you very much, Ken, for uh, talking with me. Oh, I'm grateful that you, that you had me. This is a, a tremendous fun. <laughs> it's good. Have a great evening because I know it's heading to yours and my day is unfolding. So thank you, Ken. It's you better. It's been it's been great. It's been awesome and it's been a joy. Let's use well, that. Thank you for saying that. It's fun for me too. And if uh, you know you have ever you know have a have a question or just want to bounce something off of somebody, by all means, you 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 know how to find me and please do. I I think I will. All right, and and, and good luck with that. Uh, putting the human face on AI. I'm, I'm, yep. I, I, we, we need more people looking at it from that perspective instead of just the perspective of this is going to help us lower our costs. This is going to help us sell more stuff. So, yeah. Mm. There's, there's, a, yeah, I, I, I'm coming in and say, let, let's have it be a good thing for us. Yeah. And that's, I think that's becoming our mission. So, um, let's see how we can do that. So, it's, cool. it's good about, wanting to do this then there's work then the hard work is how do we do this so it's good cool man thanks ken thank you take care